Hi guys, welcome to this muscular system video. In this video, we're going to talk about muscle contraction and production of force in muscles, and we're going to look at some linked ideas known as wave summation, tetanus, and TREP. Let's get started. Let's just briefly begin by reminding ourselves of how a motor unit works. So a motor unit is a motor neuron and all the fibers that that motor neuron innervates. So all the fibers that are attached to that motor um, motor neuron that contract when a sufficient electrical impulse arrives. So in terms of our purposes for today, we're talking about contraction of the muscle fiber. So the first thing we need to remember is that an electrical impulse is sent along the neuron. And the, that nerve impulse, that electrical impulse, arrives at what's known as the neuromuscular junction. And the neuromuscular junction is simply the gap between the end of the neuron, known as the axon terminal. There's a little gap there before we get to the muscle fiber itself, or the out, outer layer, the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber. So there's a tiny little gap. And so somehow that electrical impulse has got to jump from the axon terminal as part of the neuron and it's got to jump across that gap or sometimes called the synaptic cleft. It's got to jump across that cleft um, to reach the sarcolemma so then it can then be propagated through the muscle fibre to cause that muscle fibre to contract. So how does that happen? Well the first thing that happens once the electrical impulse arrives at the axon terminal is that these tiny little pouches called vesicles um, release a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine and acetylcholine then transmits the impulse across the neuromuscular junction so acetylcholine transmits the electrical impulse that's come along the neuron transmits it across that cleft across that little gap um, across the neuromuscular junction to reach the muscle fiber itself then on the opposite side of the synapse that acetylcholine then binds to the surface of the muscle fiber and allows the impulse to travel into the muscle fiber. And the knock on effect of that, once the, once the impulse has innervated the muscle fibers, those fibers that are linked in this motor unit, once the impulse has innervated those fibers, the knock on impact is that calcium ions, calcium ions are released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a part of the muscle fiber where these ions are stored, release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm. And it's the sarcoplasm, which is that fluid that surrounds um, the actin and myosin filaments, which you'll remember from previous videos. So around the actin and myosin filaments, these microscopic filaments deep within the muscle fiber, we have the sarcoplasm. And now because this electrical impulse has been transmitted into the fiber, it causes calcium ions to flood into the sarcoplasm. Now, as I explained in the cross bridge cycle video, you'll remember that calcium is necessary to bind with troponin so that tropomyosin can release the binding sites. What does that look like then? So let's just, if, if you want to go back to that video to, to see it in full detail, then please do so. But let's just briefly recap it here. So if we take a moment to think about the cross bridge cycle again, you can go back to the video and, and watch the full details on this. But just to briefly recap, we have these two filaments um, that slide past one another to produce movement in the muscle. What happens is the myosin filament uh, the heads on the myosin or the thicker filament that you can see at the bottom of the screen reach up and will bind to the actin filament under certain circumstances. And once they're bound, they will slide or they will, the, the myosin thick filament will move the actin filament with respect to itself. So they'll slide past one another. But that can only happen under certain conditions. And very simply, those conditions um, are that the tropomyosin that covers over the binding sites can only be moved if the troponin, um, which are, are proteins, if the troponin can pull them off those binding sites. Now that only happens if the troponin changes shape. And the thing that causes troponin to change shape is when calcium ions flood into the sarcoplasm. Those calcium ions bind with troponin 
and having bound with troponin they pull or they move the sh they change the shape of the troponin actually and by changing the shape of the troponin it pulls the tropomyosin off those black binding sites so now the black binding sites have been uh, made available for the myosin heads the pink myosin heads you can see at the bottom there to reach up and bind to the binding sites and then move the actin filament so the point is this without calcium ions flooding into the sarcoplasm there could be no cross bridge cycle so as the calcium ions flood in as a consequence of that action potential of that um, electrical impulse that is how muscular contraction comes about without the calcium binding on the troponin the tropomyosin would remain covering the binding sites on those actin filaments and that would therefore prohibit the myosin heads from binding to the filaments and producing movement so to summarize before we move on the calcium ions flood into the cell from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and enable muscle contraction but that calcium is only present when an electrical impulse innovates or stimulates the cell via the neuron. And what's important to know is as soon as the signal stops, as soon as that electrical impulse stops arriving, the calcium begins to be drawn back out of the sarcoplasm and into storage again. And that therefore has the consequence of recovering the binding sites and ultimately relaxing the muscle fibers so the rest of this video is about what happens if that electrical signal is repeated and what happens if it's repeated more frequently or maintained over over a period of time what happens in terms of the calcium and therefore what happens in terms of the muscle contraction itself okay so on this graph um, I'm going to show what it looks like in terms of force production when an electrical impulse arrives at the muscle fiber. So across the bottom of the graph, we've got time. Uh, and this is in milliseconds. So we're talking about very, very small uh, fractions of, of time here. So milliseconds across the bottom. Uh, and then along the side on the y-axis, we've got tension. So you could, you could call that force production if you prefer. So this is force production by the fibers in the muscle so time across the x-axis tension on the y-axis and what happens is initially we're timing it from the arrival of the action potential so essentially the action potential is the moment where the electrical impulse arrives at the muscle fiber or at the muscle cell itself and the name we give to this kind of graph is a myogram m-y-o-g-r-a-m a myogram so a single impulse, a single impulse, um, one action potential produces a single twitch in the muscle fiber, which is represented by the black line on the graph. This is a single twitch in the muscle fiber. And we use the word twitch, you remember, when we talk about different types of muscle fibers that contract with different speeds. So slow twitch fibers, the graph would look similar, only that it would be more stretched out and fast twitch fibers again similar only more condensed in terms of time so that's the difference between a slow twitch and a fast twitch fiber um, but essentially the the twitch looks somewhat similar on a graph like this now we're going to break this down into three phases three main phases of this twitch following on from the action potential the, the point at which the electrical impulse arrives at the muscle fiber and the first phase is called the latent phase the latent phase or the latent period and this is the tiny gap in time during which the calcium ions are being pumped into the sarcoplasm from the sarcoplasmic reticulum but they haven't yet arrived in sufficient numbers to cause the cross bridge cycle to occur so we call that the latent period so the calcium ions are flooding in at this point but there's not yet sufficient of them to create um, much change in tension in the muscle much change in the force production of the muscle now the second phase is called the contraction phase or the contraction period so this is where those calcium ions are flooded in and continue to flood in as the tension increases uh, 
um, flooded into the sarcoplasm and have caused, as we've just looked at, have caused the binding of actin and myosin filaments to one another, or the myosin to the actin, which then slide past each other to create muscular movement. And so this is shown on the on the myogram as an increase, a, a steep increase in tension or in force production. And it's linked directly to the flooding of the sarcoplasm with calcium ions. So as calcium ions flood in, the the, the knock-on impact, the tropomyosin, the troponin, and the binding sites being uncovered, the myosin heads attaching to and so on. Basically, to cut a long story short, the calcium floods in and the contraction, um, the, the tension of the contraction increases in proportion to the calcium flooding in. So what happens next? Once the impulse subsides, there is a sharp decrease in the force being produced or the tension in the muscle. This is essentially muscle relaxation. So we call this the relaxation period or the relaxation phase. And this is because if there's only one impulse, only one action potential uh, at the front end of this twitch, if there's only one, the impulse that's been sent from the motor neuron, um, if there's only one of those impulses, then the calcium ions, as soon as um, the, the cross bridge cycle has, has occurred once, as soon as the calcium stops flooding in because the action potential has now died down. As soon as we get to that point and there's no second action potential, there's no second impulse, then the calcium ions flood back out again, causing the tropomyosin to recover the binding sites and therefore break the cross bridge cycle or break the cross bridges. And that therefore, because those filaments are no longer connected to one another are no longer bridged that causes relaxation in the fiber or in the group of fibers that had initially been contracted or that had been twitching so we've got the three phases here we've got the latent period we've got the contraction period and we've got the relaxation period now then what's important to think about and we're going to think about on the next slide is what happens if we get another impulse quickly after the initial impulse. Okay, so here we've got another myogram. Uh, we've got time in milliseconds across the x-axis. We've got force of contraction up on the y-axis. And we know already what the myogram looks like if there's a single action potential that arrives at the neuromuscular junction. A single action potential causes a single twitch in the muscle fiber which increases in line with the amount of um, calcium that floods in and then decreases as that calcium then floods back out and is stored again in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That we call a single twitch. But what happens if the muscle or the motor unit as a whole receives a second action potential, a second electrical impulse before the calcium ions that flooded in initially from the first action potential have had chance to, to be removed from the sarcoplasm. What happens if they're still in there when a second impulse arrives? So those calcium ions do not immediately flood back out of the sarcoplasm, but they remain available and continue to bind to troponin, allowing cross bridge formation between actin and myosin. But in this case, since another impulse has arrived we have those original calcium ions plus some more calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum flooding in to join them so now because we've got an increased number of calcium ions in the sarcoplasm we also have increased numbers of binding between those calcium ions and the troponin and so therefore more troponin binding with more calcium ions means more tropomyosin being moved off the binding sites. So when we have more binding sites being uncovered on those actin filaments, there's more opportunity for the myosin heads to attach or to produce a cross bridge between the myosin and the actin, increasing the overall total force 
in that muscle fiber or in that muscle cell. So the overall force of contraction is increased if we increase the amount of calcium ions in the sarcoplasm. And that's exactly what happens if we get a second electrical impulse quickly after the first one. And this is what it looks like on the myogram. So if the second impulse is sufficiently close in time to the previous impulse, then due to the greater number of binding sites being exposed, the strength of the contraction actually increases beyond the strength produced by a single twitch. And so the waves on the myogram indicate, as you can see, that the strength of the contraction, the contractile force, adds up. It sums together to produce a greater total force. And this adding together of the contractile force is what we call wave summation. And as you can see, it's a direct consequence of the arrival of a second electrical impulse immediately or in very short order after the first impulse. So if those impulses come quickly together, the summation of those twitches reaches a greater force of contraction than a single twitch would do. Now then, this can continue repeatedly up to a point if the impulses continue to arrive from the motor neuron or from the neuron. So in this case, if we have multiple repeated, um, multiple re repeated firing, multiple repeated impulses, well, what happens then in terms of the force of contraction? Well, again, because the calcium ions are not being given the opportunity to fully flood back out of the, of the sarcoplasm and back into storage in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, um, those calcium ions that maybe have begun to return to storage in, in the sarcoplasmic reticulum are quickly pushed back into the sarcoplasm as soon as the next impulse arrives. So on the myogram, this is how it looks. So there, there may be a momentary dip before the next impulse causes a consecutive wave summation and then another summation and then another summation. So these wave summations are adding on top of one another. There's this momentary dip as the calcium ions perhaps begin to move back into storage but are prevented from doing so by another electrical impulse coming in quickly. So this consecutive summation is known as TREP, TREP. And uh, TREPA is actually the German word for a staircase. So it's anglicized, we just pronounce it as TREP, um, but it's anglicized and it's from the, the German word for a staircase, which is what, um, what it looks like essentially, is how it looks on the, uh, on the, on the graph, on the myogram. It's also sometimes referred to as unfused or incomplete tetanus. And so that gives us a clue as to what the final section of this myogram is going to reveal. So if the electrical impulses are sufficiently frequent, so you can see here that they come even more rapidly, even more frequently. That is, there's a very small gap between the impulses. There isn't even time for some of the calcium ions to begin to move back out of the sarcoplasm. They're all maintained in there. So because of this repeated rapid electrical impulse, two things combine together. First of all, the maximum number of binding sites are uncovered, which therefore maximizes the cross bridges that are formed. And secondly, there's no opportunity for calcium ions to flood back out of the sarcoplasm and into storage. So those two things mean that basically the calcium ions are fully deployed. And so at this point, the contractile force remains for a while constant at its maximum force, at the maximum force of contraction. So provided the impulses come very rapidly, hot on the heels of one another, then we will see a maximum force of contraction um, in the muscle fibers that are attached or a part of that motor unit. And this is called fused or complete tetanus.
So we have single twitch, we have wave summation, we have unfused tetanus and we have fused tetanus. And all of these are dictated to by the availability and volume of calcium ions in the sarcoplasm, which is determined by how many and how frequent the impulses are that arrive in the, from the motor neuron. So the motor neuron dictates the inflow of calcium ions and the volume of calcium ions or the number of calcium ions in the sarcoplasm dictates the type of contraction and ultimately the force of contraction that can be produced in those muscle cells, in those muscle fibers that are attached to that motor neuron. Well, that's it for this video. I hope that helps you understand how uh, contractile force is produced as a consequence of the electrical impulses coming from the motor neuron. Uh, we've looked at wave summation, unfused and fused tetanus and TREP as well. If you've got any questions, please um, drop them below and I'll, I'll get back to you. But please don't forget, subscribe and hit the notification bell uh, so you can get notified when the next video is uploaded. Take care for now.